Ben Booker, and I'm a family nurse practitioner here at Tanner County Medical Center in Kandu, North Dakota. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about of what a family nurse practitioner does, and then I'm going to show you a very common uh, skill that nurse practitioners uh, utilize often, and that is uh, suturing um, a wound. Uh, so for most nurse practitioner programs, uh, your first step is that you have to become a registered nurse. And so that involves four years of undergraduate uh, college. And then you'll graduate with your uh, BSN, which is a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. And then from there, you would go and work as an RN, uh, anywhere from a minimum of one year to really as long as you wanted to be an RN. And then you would apply for graduate school, uh, which then you would become a nurse practitioner uh, upon graduating graduate school and that would be your master's of nurse practitioner or a doctorate uh, of nurse practitioner. Um, so all in all you're looking at anywhere from six to seven years of college uh, with one year in between uh, where you'd be practicing as an RN. So an RN stands for a registered nurse and what that means is uh, basically you would practice nursing. Uh, there is a lot of detail that goes into the scope of nursing practice. The main difference between a nurse practitioner and a registered nurse is that a nurse practitioner has the ability to practice independently, has the ability to make diagnoses, uh, order tests, order x-rays, CTs, MRIs, and prescribe medications. Very similar to what a physician would do. There are a lot of uh, universities and colleges in North Dakota that offer uh, nursing school. Um, I would say there's probably seven or eight in the state, uh, as big as NDSU or UND, or as small as, for example, uh, uh, the Dakota College in Botno, if you wanted to stay kind of more local. Um, and then as far as nurse practitioner schools go, they're located mainly in the, in the larger uh, communities. Although now uh, you, you, are, you are seeing a lot more virtual and online classes for a uh, nurse practitioner. So uh, upon graduation, um, I've always worked in rural health. Uh, I think for a nurse practitioner, you have a lot of autonomy in rural health. It's a very exciting uh, place to be. You can also work in the urban settings uh, in larger, uh, larger facilities. Um, I enjoy the, the smaller town uh, practice because a lot of times you are uh, the only one there that's, that's uh, providing care, uh, which is exciting. And then um, if you work in a smaller facility, uh, likely you're expected to work in the clinic, in the hospital. If there's a nursing home, you'd work in the nursing home, then you'd also work in the emergency department. So when you're in the clinic working as a nurse practitioner, uh, a lot of your practice is focused on uh, management of chronic conditions and chronic diseases such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, etc. Um, and then you would see patients in the hospital. You would be you would be admitting patients, rounding on patients, and discharging patients. You'd likely see patients over at the nursing home. Nursing home patients have a lot of uh, chronic conditions that need to be managed, and so it would be on the nurse practitioner to do that. And then likely you would work in the emergency room as well. Um, Larger facilities, if you wanted to work there, you likely would not be required to do uh, emergency rooms. So if that's not for you, you may want to consider working in a larger facility. If you like the emergency room, then small town is for you. Um, depending on where you work, the pay range would be anywhere from $100,000 a year all the way up to about $300,000 a year. If you work in the smaller community, Usually, which is what you might think is the opposite, but usually you end up actually making more in a smaller community because your responsibilities are greater. Uh, there's a lot of ER call that you have to take um, and a lot of clinic hours you put in and then you're rounding on the, on the inpatients. A larger facility, mainly you work in the clinic and if you were to admit a patient, you would admit them to a hospital of service. You probably wouldn't see the patient again. And if you have a patient that's critically ill, uh, you'd send them to the ER where then the ER physician or provider would take over. So when you're in the smaller community, there is more responsibility. So if you like that, if you like the autonomy, if you like a higher pay, uh, and you like seeing a lot of variety of patients, then small town is for you. However, one, one drawback is that you are required to take uh, ER call. And so um, for our team, that means one night a week you're on call and call starts at 5 p.m. and ends at eight o'clock in the morning. There's nights where you don't see a patient 
Uh, you just happen to have a quiet night and there's nights where you see eight or nine patients. Um, so it all depends. And then uh, for a weekend, our weekend call starts at 5 p.m. on Friday and ends at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. So there's a fair amount to call. Uh, the type of patients that you see range anywhere from acute injuries, like a cut, all the way uh, from coughs and colds, all the way up to major traumas, heart attacks and strokes. So you need to be prepared to, to handle those patients. Um, so that's kind of basically uh, the role of a nurse practitioner. Um, and then we'll get into uh, a skill that, uh, that will come in handy if you do take uh, the rural health road and, and do some emergency room work. going to be showing you a suture technique and this is called uh, simple interrupted sutures and so the first step I do when I have a patient with an obvious laceration is uh, wear my gloves and then I'm going to be anesthetizing the skin of course you'd want to clean the skin with chloroprep or betadine or whatever your facility has and then we'd be using 1% uh, lidocaine is the numbing agent very similar to Novocaine just a different brand name I'm sure all of you have had Novocaine at one point or the other after I draw up my lidocaine I will anesthetize the area so basically what you're going to be doing is kind of starting right here the first poke is usually the most painful so you want to make the poke inject lidocaine and then you go on the opposite side make a poke inject lidocaine and then the nice way to do it is when you've injected your lidocaine it's nice to go where you've already anesthetized so that you're not having the patient go through 10 or 11 sticks which are painful so now that I'm going here, most likely the patient is not going to feel um, the stick of the needle. They might feel some burning from the actual lidocaine itself, but when you go into an area that you already anesthetized, uh, it does work the best for patient comfort. So I would have gone all the way down uh, this area with the lidocaine. Usually the lidocaine is quite instant but it's always good to give it about a minute to let the full anesthesia take effect. And then what I would do is I'm going to be putting on my sterile gloves. Um, this is a sterile technique because there is a risk of infection anytime you're breaking the skin. And so we want to use sterile technique for this procedure. So we start with our gloves and then making sure not to touch anything else not to touch your other hand with your sterile hand and so now my gloves my hands are sterile the inside of this package is sterile so I can take this and remove it and then we have our sterile field here and this um, suturing kit comes out of a package which is sterile as well. So now that we have everything ready to go, we'll start with suturing. So when you have a laceration like this, you, you don't want to start at this end and go this way because you might end up having the skin kind of move and shift and then when you're done you might end up with an area that is quite elevated and doesn't line up so a laceration about this size I would want to start right in the middle and then work this way or work that way so the first thing I would do is take my forceps and retract the skin and then you take a bite of the skin 
and then come up. Take another bite of the skin, which is about a centimeter. And then you bring this through and come to about there, leaving about three inches of suture material at the end. And for your first pass through, you want to grab with your forceps, you want to do two loops around, grab, and then pull through. And then you want to make sure that the skin approximates very well. You don't want to do it too tight where the skin is overlapping and not uh, not tight enough where there's still uh, an area that the wound is open. So once you do your first pass, the next few is just one loop. Grab, come through, and then go the opposite way around because you want to make nice tight square knots. Come through, and then again, down and through. And normally you would have an assistant in the room where you don't have to be putting your tools down and you would cut leaving about a centimeter of suture material. So you don't want this to get caught on anything and you want enough where when the sutures need to come out you have something to grab. So we would continue on um, with suturing. It, uh, a cut of this size I would say is going to need about um, 8 to 10 sutures. So once again this is the end of the of the wound here this is where I've sutured so once again I would go in the middle and then I would go here and then I would go here to create a nice even suture line so once again you take a bite with your needle come up through the wound take another bite come up and then we'll make our loops again so first loop is always going to be two and then you can just do one. And you'd want to do about five or six throws to make sure that you get a suture that is nice and secure. So we'll do one more. And again, cut. And I'll finish with one more suture here. Um, so as you can see, now my next suture is going to be here, and then here, and then here. Now, unlike the first ones that we did, because I'm getting close where the wound is getting completely closed, I'm not going to be able to peel the skin back and take a bite out of each side. So for this one, you kind of want to be at the end of your, of your needle and we're just going to go down and through the entire wound and then up. And that's just because we're running out of room and I don't want to be pulling back 
a wound that is recently healed. So this time we just went underneath the entire wound and came up. And then the technique is going to be the same where um, we go two loops. Grab and pull through. And then you can use your hand too if you're not wanting to use. A lot of times with these uh, small suture material, it can be difficult to grab with the forceps. Once you're in and you have one done, keeping in mind that you don't want to be cut, uh, getting cut by the needle, uh, you can just use your hand and sometimes it's a lot better. You'll get faster as time goes on, but you can see with that you can move a little bit quicker. And as you can see there, we've got a nice approximation of, uh, of the skin on both sides. And if we were to finish the wound out, we would probably add two more here, and it looks like about three more there. Um, real quick, when the sutures are ready to come out, it is quite simple. You just go underneath with a scissors, grab one side, pull the other side out. So go in, pull up on the suture, cut, pull, and then for the last one, raise the suture up, place the scissors underneath the suture, one cut, and pull. And that's it. That is simple interrupted suture technique.